Happened to me again two weeks ago. Happens all the time, it seems like. At least every time I head that way, you would think I would learn. But I am slow to learn. I was on my way to a meeting, just buzzing along in the traffic. Local meeting. Some people that ride with me or have ridden behind me will remark that I drive kind of fast. Well, I'm busy. You're busy. We've got things to do, places to go. So I'm buzzing over to this meeting, in and out of the traffic, in and out of the traffic. Things are going along pretty well. All of a sudden, I find myself in a parking lot. I was on my way down to Wrightsville Beach. I did not get the opportunity to meet one of Wilmington's finest. Nor did I turn off the Eastwood Road. I just found myself in a parking lot. You've probably done the same thing. Why was I in the parking lot? The bridge. The bridge. I don't go to Wrightsville Beach for meetings very often, so I did not consider the bridge. And I'm on my way to my meeting, and all of a sudden I'm in this parking lot, and I'm looking at my clock, and I've got eight minutes. Eight minutes before the meeting starts. Now, I'm excited about getting to this meeting, but I have found myself in the waiting room. The parking lot. What do you do when you find yourself in the waiting room? I'll tell you what I do. There are several things that cross my mind. First thing I usually do is I get mad. How about you? You ever get angry sitting in the waiting room? You're busy. You got things to do. You got a schedule like I've got a schedule. Important schedule. Don't have time for the waiting room. Get ourselves in a waiting room mess, we can get angry. Tend to mutter some words maybe under our breath. If you're sitting in that parking lot, you begin to have bad thoughts about that bridge tender. He opens that bridge every hour, on the hour. Whether he needs to or not, just opens that bridge. Like he had no idea what your schedule is, and you're just sitting there. I sit there and I look. I think, there must be a tall mass that's going to pass by at some point. Nothing passes by. He just saw me coming. <laughs> Raised the bridge. When we get angry like that, at least I realize that no matter how perturbed I get, he can't hear me. He doesn't know my thoughts. He's not going to lower that bridge just because I want him to. We're just there, waiting in our anger. We can wallow around in self-pity. Not that that changes anything, but sometimes I find myself floundering around in this feeling of pity and sorrow, this prison I create for myself, doesn't make me feel any better, doesn't change my circumstances. Maybe self-pity changes your circumstances, usually doesn't cause the clock to move any quicker. Sometimes we can point the finger of blame at someone. You know, that helps, blame it on someone else. Adam said, Eve caused me to do it. As a parent, my children have heard me say a few times, if you had done what I asked you to do, have you ever said, hey, it's not my fault. I hate things are like they are, but it's not my fault. Sometimes when we end, our, end up in a mess, in that waiting room, it doesn't change anything, but it makes us feel better to point our finger at someone else. It's their fault. We can give up. Just give up on the journey. Just look at the clock and say, you know what? Just not going to make it. I'm just going to give up. Let you all know something now. Saturday night, flotilla, Wrightsville Beach. If you want to see it, go early. More than once, I have sat and watched the moon begin to rise and turned around and went home. And watched it on WECT at 11 o'clock. Just give up. Give up on the journey. Throw in the towel. Some people do that in the midst of all types of circumstances. They just quit. They quit on themselves. 
They quit on their dreams. They quit on other people. They quit on God. They quit on life. Oh, they continue to breathe, walk around, exist. You see them, I see them, but they're not really living. You know anybody like that? We don't have any of those folks in our congregation, and I don't know anybody that's like that. Not right now, but, you know, there have been people like that. Maybe the Bible brings a couple to mind. Who's supposed to have lived longer than anybody else, according to the Bible? Your question for the day. Who's the oldest person to have ever lived? Methuselah. And how long did Methuselah live? <laughs> Bible says 969 years. My wife asked me, do you think that they had calendars the same as ours? I said, baby, I don't know, but 969 is a long time, no matter how many months they had in the year. This is what the Bible says about Methuselah. Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 782 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and 9 years. And he died. That's it. World famous, lived longer than anybody else, 969 years, and he died. Does that not disturb you? Would you hate to live 969 years and begat and begat and begat, and that's it? How disappointing. How tragic to have lived that long and never lived at all. When we find ourselves in the waiting room, we could use some more positive things to do than get angry or create this pool of self-pity or give up or point our fingers at other people, blaming them. Maybe we could do what Becca talked about, what PJ read about, what we saw on the screen, what God's Word says that we should do. Maybe when we find ourselves in that waiting room, we could be joyful. We could pray. We could focus on things for which we're thankful. You know, we have lots to be thankful for. Lots. Your list is probably as long as mine, maybe longer. Some are large and some are small. Things like love, faith, family, friends, food, freedom, coffee, Bacon, Sight, First Baptist Church, Sunshine, Rain, Paper Cuts, Paper Cuts. Why should we be thankful for paper cuts? Have you had one lately? Got one this week. You know what it reminded me of? It reminds me that even when one tiny part of our body is in pain, the whole body suffers. Think about that. When one tiny part of this body is in pain, the whole body suffers. When one tiny part of this nation is in pain, the whole nation suffers. Paper cuts, something for which to be thankful. If you and I have corresponded in writing, you know that after most of my scribblings, there's a word that appears, hopeful. I always put that word out there, hopeful. It's not by accident, it's intentional. I put it out there to remind myself that I am to do what the writer of 1 Thessalonians does, said, be joyful. Pray continually. Be thankful for things, no matter how good or bad they may be. Be hopeful. The intentional part of that is to remind myself and to share that word of hope with you as a congregation, as a people, all the people that I encounter every day.
Try and remind them to be hopeful. A dictionary definition of the word is the feeling that what is desired can be had. But when we mix it up there at the recipe of God's word, I think hope becomes something else. The Apostle Paul recorded that along with faith and love, hope is one of the three things that remains forever. I like the way the poet Emily Dickinson defined it. She wrote it this way. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Hear that again. The thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops. In my 57 years, I've found that the word, the feeling, the attitude of a hope appear in some unlikely places. Cancer clinics, rehabilitation centers, shelters for homeless people, third world countries, situations and places where hope may be the least expected but needed most. I remember well conversations with my mother after she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. She didn't know what the future looked like. My mother liked to look good. She didn't know what she was going to look like. That was a concern for her, going through treatment and surgeries and things like that. She didn't know how many Thanksgivings she was going to have or how many Christmases she was going to have, how long she was going to spend with us. But she was hopeful. And she continued going forward in the midst of her tragedy until she was received into the arms of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And for that, I give God thanks. I remember well those conversations as she would sit and she would say, you know, I may not be with you much longer, but I'll be with God. And that makes everything okay. Because I know one day you will be with God too. When you hear that there's a one in, one in ten chance of recovery or victory or survival, that's when hope kicks in. When the world screams out, you have no chance, forget it. That's when hope kicks in. You've lost your job. You're living with chronic illness. You move to another place for a new beginning because everything behind you is bad. You're facing economic failure. The kids are driving you crazy. Your spouse just walked out on you. You're pacing the floor in the hospital's emergency department. That's when hope comes to life most often. And when that hope is solid in trusting God, there's an amazing richness of grace and love that flows down from the hand of the Almighty One. The Apostle Paul wrote, God says, my grace is sufficient. Now there's some cynics that would say, oh Jim, you're a pastor. You have to preach that pie in the, high, that pie in the sky stuff. You know what? I don't have to preach anything. I preach hope. Because I see it in you. It's not a word. It's not a feeling. It's a reality. And I see it all around me. I've been here 26 years and lived with this family of hope for all these years. I have watched it come out in your life. Watched it in the words that you've said. In the attitudes that you have. In the life that you live. In the way you share it with so many other people. No, it's not just a feeling. It's a reality. I've seen you walk the talk and talk the walk of believing that the God will meet your needs and bless you with miraculous harvests of love and grace even when things don't turn out the way that you'd like for them to. In the midst of some of your most difficult days, you have lived out for me hope in the face of the storm. The way you live every single day is pregnant with the radical possibility of endless hope especially in the midst of the major storms that you have faced, because I have had the privilege of walking with you and watching you. You hold on to that hope because you know, not that God might do something, but that God has already done something. That God has already done something that changed your life and changed this world. That God is currently doing things because God does not sleep, but God is active in the midst of everything that we are about. And you are hopeful that God will continue to do amazing things. My son called me on a Friday afternoon about a year ago. I assumed, he asked, I assume that you're free tomorrow. I am. I thought the invitation was going to come for he and I to go to a football game together. 
and that I would buy the tickets. <laughs> but as it turned out, Jonathan says, hey, wondering if you'd be available, I'd like to go shopping tomorrow morning and would like for you and Mom to go with me. I'd like to go look for a ring. Well, we were pretty shocked about that. Jonathan was only 28 at the time and said that he would not be married until he's 31. But I thought, well, he's kind of slow in a lot of things. Maybe it'd be a long engagement. <laughs> it was not a long engagement, and he knew what he was looking for. My wife and I went with him on that Saturday morning. It's been a long time since I've been to the jewelry store looking for diamonds. We got there, and the lady was wonderful. The jeweler was terrific. She brought out a little bag. It was full of these tiny little gems. She laid out a big black piece of velvet, and she would set those tiny gems on that black velvet, one at the time, with the perfect light shining on it so that he could see every one of the sparkles in each and every little stone. As Jonathan examined those stones closely and as we looked at them, he didn't ask about how much it cost. He was just looking for the one that he knew was his, the way God looked at you and recognized that you were his, and God didn't matter how much it cost, even if it cost God, God's son. As Jonathan looked at those tiny little stones, I thought about how hope is a lot like that, that the brilliant con contrast of that stone and the sparkle of those stones against that dark background is a lot like hope. How even in our darkest valleys is when hope really begins to sparkle. Henry Sloan Coffin was a much better preacher than me, and that's why he was the preacher at the Riverside Church in New York City for many years. He preached this about hope and waiting. Waiting often reflects the cruel darkness and the magnificent light that seem eternally to be at the heart of divine and human encounters. Waiting often reflects the cruel darkness and the magnificent light that seem eternally to be at the heart of divine and human encounters. Jesus summed it up in a lot less words. Jesus said, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Whatever else that verse means, it must at least mean that as surely as there are times when we find ourselves struggling in the waiting room, there are also things that have come our way that transcend our wildest dreams. Maybe that's what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote, No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. I was trying to think of a biblical example of hope in the waiting room, thinking of one of those divine human encounters. And the one that came to mind quickest to me was the story of Noah and God and the great flood. The story of how Noah and that zoo of gorgeous and something less than gorgeous animals and birds that he pulled together and became his shipmates for some long time. It was God's intention that the crown of God's creation would live in harmony with one another, but we humans chose and we continue to choose otherwise. We really don't like each other as much as God would like for us to like each other, and so we choose to defend ourselves and to sometimes hurt our brothers and our sisters. What we've created is a world of violence, physical violence, financial violence, mental violence, emotional violence, in the last few months, political violence. You fill in the blank. There's plenty of it to go around. The wickedness and the willful ignorance is surely a lot less than what God desired for us way back then or today. I have a great aunt, Aunt Shelby. Aunt, aunt Shelby lives with Jesus now, and I'm so glad because she so wanted to go live with Jesus. You talk about being frustrated and waiting. This woman was so frustrated that she had to live here for as long as she did. She was always waiting to get to heaven. Aunt Shelby used to say, you know, baby, when she had that little snuff in the bottom of her lip as we'd sit on the porch, she said, there ain't no doubt in my mind. Gabriel's up there barking at God right now. Just let me blow the horn. Just let me blow the horn, God, and end it all. Just let me blow the horn. 
kind of like those disciples. You know Jesus' band of brothers? When they passed through the town of Samaria and they were looking for a place to stay, and the Samaritan said, not in our village. Remember how the Samaritan said to Jesus, let us just rain down fire on this place, burn the whole place up. Jesus had a different idea as to what we needed to do when there was no room at the inn. You know, God had an idea of what to do when there was no room at the inn. But that's a story for next week and next month. So we'll get over there then. Let's get back to Noah for now. Here Noah was in the midst of an awful situation. Certainly God was frustrated, Noah was frustrated, and all of humanity was frustrated, and God was ready just to wipe everything out. But you know, there's a short little verse there in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, that says, but Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of God. Noah, of all people. You see, Noah made faith in God more than just a one-day-a-week exercise. He was convinced that God loved him even though things weren't so good for him. So Noah built the ark that God told him to build. He collected the pairs of animals. He persuaded his family to join him inside the boat, and he shut the door before the clouds opened up. Outside, there was rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Six weeks of gray days with no sun and dark nights with no supermoons and no stars. Imagine what it must have been like inside that ark for Noah and his family. In my mind, only the storm on the outside could make bearable the stench on the inside. Can you picture Noah every day making his rounds? He's assuring his family that the best is yet to be. You ever heard that word? And also feeding those animals. The wait was long. The wait was agonizing. It wasn't just the 40 days and 40 nights. Scripture says it was the 10th month before the tops of the mountains could even be seen. And after 10 months in that boat, and he could see the top of the mountains, Noah sent out a raven, and it never came back. Where was his hope? A week later, he sent out a dove, and the dove flew around and flew around and flew around and flew around. Came back empty mouth. A few days later, he sent out the dove again. Noah was not going to give up. Sent out the dove again, and this time, Scripture says the dove came back, and in the dove's mouth was a freshly picked olive leaf, the validation of hope. When Noah saw that bird come back, and he saw what was in that bird's mouth, he must have wet his pants. <laughs> Tired of water all around him, but there's no doubt. I'll bet he wet his pants. God promised to never destroy the earth again. And you know what? God doesn't have to. Why? Because the crown of God's creation is doing a pretty good job right now. And if we aren't doing a pretty good job right now, at least we've got the potential to do it, don't we? God doesn't have to destroy what's around us. We can do it for ourselves. Unfortunately, after that long wait, and after Noah's pants dried out, after he had been saved from himself and from the flood and from his neighbors and from the animals and from his family and from the stench, what did Noah do? Noah got drunk. Yeah. Read Genesis. Noah got drunk. Not to celebrate what he'd just been through, but because the present and the future looked so overwhelming to Noah, he couldn't stand the reality of it. Folks, these may not be our best days. But now is not the time for us to get drunk on the liquor of power or the alcohol of retribution or the sweet wine of blame or the micro-brew of self-pity. This is the day to hear the hopeful words of God. Hopeful words 
from the Apostle Paul that said we're to be joyful and we're to pray continually and we're to give God thanks in all circumstances. And a hopeful word from Peter. Some would say he was Jesus' best friend, but I think you are. And Jesus thinks you are too. This is what Peter wrote to us. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered for a little while will himself Restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Will you pray with me? Loving God, forgive us when we pause for just a few days a year to give you thanks. Forgive us, God, when sometimes we think that we have built this great world on our own. And we pat ourselves on the back for what we have accomplished. Forgive us, God, when sometimes we gather, yeah, gather even to worship. We say we do, but sometimes, Lord, we gather not to worship but to get because we always want a little more. Thank you, O oh God, that you have an endless supply of grace and love joy, and that you have provided for us, God, the opportunity and the hope of eternity with you. Lord, we thank you for your son Christ that walks among us, lives within us, invites us to join him, not just in mission and ministry, but in love and grace. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen.